Amen. Amen. Through the good times and the bad times, he never changes. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and just thank God for his presence and for everything that he's been doing. Hallelujah. In our lives, God, we thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, God. We give you glory, God. We love you, Lord. We magnify your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Water. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I was going to tell uh, Michaela where she oh, she's back there. I was gonna tell, I, you look pretty this morning. I like that dress. Yeah. Amen. I like it when these girls, when these young girls wear those dresses. Now, not the short dresses, but the, you know, we want, we like the modest dresses, but y'all look good. I think girls should wear dresses. I try to get my girls to wear dresses. It, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a struggle more with Amber than it is with Emma, but uh, I think it's good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Especially in the times we're living in today. So you young ladies, you, you wear those dresses. Now those modest dresses, that's what we want to see you wear. Amen. But you wear those dresses and, and wear them boldly. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If you grew up in, in church in mom's day, where mom grew up, that's all you was allowed to wear. <laughs> No matter what you did, you had to wear dresses. But, uh, amen, y'all look pretty in those dresses. Amen. Amen. It, and, um, and and you, you young men, you know, I'm glad I'm not seeing your underwear when you come in here. Amen. I don't, I don't need to know what kind of underwear you're wearing. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you want to look, we're going to start out in Joshua chapter 24. Tonight, Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> um, something the Lord gave to me or spoke to me this week, and this must be for somebody, but I, I want to talk to you from the subject choices. And and I want to show you uh, scripturally some things. Um, I've got some notes on some things. I also got some scriptures that the Lord gave me that I don't have any notes on. So we'll just see what the Lord uh, wants to do here tonight. But I want to talk to you about <clears throat> choices. And I want to uh, hopefully give you a revelation on the power of uh, the power of Choices or the power of having a choice. I might have could have, I might have could have uh, worded this or, or titled this different. But anyway, Joshua chapter twenty-four, verse thirteen. If you're ready, say Amen. All right, and I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build. Joshua chapter twenty-four, verse thirteen. And you dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted not do you eat now therefore fear the lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood um, and in egypt and serve ye the lord and if it seem evil unto to you to serve the lord then choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the amorites in whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the lord hallelujah amen look at somebody if you can find somebody we're few and far between but look at them and say choose choose hallelujah amen amen father let your anointing take over tonight think through our minds speak through our lips let us leave here different than we came in father in the mighty name of jesus amen <clears throat> um here in joshua chapter 24 and, and let me tell you how i come across this 
I had no idea what the Lord was going to say. And he said, I want you to read in Joshua. And I was like, all right. And he said, I want you to go past the walls of Jericho, go past all that and, and read deeper into Joshua. And I said, well, what chapter? And he said, chapter 24. And this is how the Lord gave me this word. So um, this, is, this, is, this is how I get words. If you wonder how I get sermons, that's how I get sermons. Amen. So I got in there and started reading. I said, Lord, what do you want to meet? What do you want to say? Well, we got into this. And, and in giving you context of where we are in this chapter, Joshua has led the children of Israel over into the promised land. Uh, remember, Moses led a generation out of Egypt. That generation died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And Joshua took the younger generation that survived and led them over into the promised land. And here they've they've gotten into the promised land and they've conquered their enemies and, and, and God is giving them their land. And he tells them here that you you've got uh, vineyards you didn't plant. Amen. You've got houses and cities that you did not build. Hallelujah. And the Lord has has done this for you. He's given you this land and he's admonishing them. And he's telling them that it's time now for you to choose who you're going to serve. And, and it's amazing that Joshua would even have to give them this speech. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, that's amazing that God can do all the things he, 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 he did for Israel. And Joshua would still have to give them a speech about choosing to serve him and be faithful to him. It's amazing that God can do what he does for us and we still have problems choosing him. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing that we still have issues choosing God in our life after he's done so many wonderful things for us. Hallelujah. And that's where Joshua is. And he's, he's telling them that you need to choose to serve this God. There's two things he mentions here that's fighting for Israel's loyalty. The gods, little g, of their fathers on the other side of the flood or on the other side of, of some translations say the Euphrates River. And he's talking about the gods that one Abraham worshipped before being called out of the Ur of Chaldees. So we're talking about the moon god, the sun god, uh, Moses, and then worshipped the zodiac back then. Hallelujah. And he's talking about the gods of their fathers before they come out of Egypt when they got caught up in those Egyptian gods. So he's talking about the, the gods of their fathers are fighting for their loyalties. And what that represents is generational sins passed down. So they, they've got generational sins fighting for their loyalty and their attention. And then the other thing he says was the gods of the Amorites. And that was the people of the land where they were presently dwelling in. So that's talking about present sin. Two things that are fighting you for your loyalty and it will be generational sins and present sins always hallelujah amen there will be things that you will battle that have been passed down from generations before you and there will be things that you will battle in your present situation just because you're living in a generation of temptation and 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 darkness and wickedness Hallelujah. So there's going to be present sin to deal with and have to deny. Hallelujah. But then there are those specific sins that are specific to you and your bloodline. That's those generational sins. You follow what I'm saying? And that could be anger passed down. It could be fear passed down, right? It could be poverty passed down, alcoholism passed down, addiction passed down. Does everybody understand that? Hallelujah. 
So we'll all, we all have those general things that tempt us in this present world, but then each, to each individual, there are those specific sins that you deal with that maybe somebody else doesn't deal with because it was in your family. Amen? Hallelujah. But now, here we are. Here's the children of Israel. They're dealing with these present gods, these present temptations, these present sins, and they're dealing with these generational sins passed down to them from their forefathers. But watch what Joshua does. Joshua puts their deliverance from the present sins, the present gods of the Amorites, the gods of their fathers, those generational sins passed down. He puts their deliverance to a choice. Are you hearing me? Joshua put their deliverance and their freedom from these things to a choice. And freedom and deliverance, children of God, is not something that just randomly happens by chance. It's always, somebody say it's always, the result, repeat after me, it's always the result of a choice. Hallelujah. It's always the result of the choice. Joshua put their deliverance from these generational curses and from these present sins to a choice. And he simply said, here's what you got to do. It's not, it's not a big thing. He didn't give them a 12-point plan or anything like that. He said, choose today who you're going to serve. Folks, now I'm going to say some stuff. And I'm not very sympathetic or empathetic or whatever you want to call it when it comes to, you know, <laughs> the things people deal with. Because my Bible doesn't make it complicated. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If it's complicated, then the blood of Jesus wasn't as powerful as the Bible says it was. The blood of Jesus didn't do what it uh, said it did. It's, it's as easy as a choice. Deliverance, breakthrough from your issues is as easy as a choice. It's a choice. Now listen to me. I'm going to try to set you free. Are you ready? If Joshua puts it to a choice here, then that means that the children of Israel are not a victim to the gods of their fathers or the gods of the Amorites. They're not a victim to generational passed down sin, nor are they a victim of present sin and circumstances. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Someone with a victim mentality that makes, ex and this is what someone does with a victim mentality, they make excuses for their bondage. Well, I'm, uh, it, you know, I've been going through this and this happened and that happened, Pastor. And, and oh, man, you just don't understand all that I've been, been going through. And it's just been bad. When you have a, that's a victim mentality. That's somebody that's making excuses for their bondage. Hallelujah. And somebody that has a victim mentality that makes excuses for their bondage is someone that believes they have no choice. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus showed up to the lame man. He showed up to the lame man, uh, Joel, and I believe it's in John chapter 6. You need to go home and read that. Hallelujah. He's lame by the pool of uh, Bethesda. And the Bible says there's all kinds of lame people laying there, right? And the angels coming down at a certain season and troubling the water. And the Bible says whoever gets in first gets their healing. Jesus shows up to a lame man. He's been lame for 38 years. He, and he asks him, will thou be made whole? And you know what he said? The first thing he said was, Lord, I don't have nobody to put me in the water when the angel comes down and troubles it. And then when I go try to get in it, somebody jumps out in front of me. Right? Amen. What kind of mentality is that? Victim mentality. Jesus didn't ask him, why are you not made whole? He said, wilt thou be made whole? I'm telling you what, God's not asking you why aren't you made whole. He's asking you, do you want to be made whole? 
Come on, somebody. Think about it. Because some of you are answering the wrong question. Can I say that again? Some of you in your life, I, want, I hope this opens your, your mind to some stuff. Some of you are answering a question that never got asked. The, what did the lame man do? He answered a question that did not get asked. Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? And he gave him excuses why he wasn't whole. That wasn't what Jesus asked. Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? All he had to do was say yes. And Jesus would have said, then get up, take up your bed and walk. Jesus is not asking you why aren't you having breakthrough or why is this going on in your life and why is that going on in your life? He ain't worried about that. He done defeated every why. Come on. He done eliminated every why. He eliminated every one of your excuses. Huh? With what? The blood. Amen. So now he's asking you to make a choice. Not an excuse, but a choice. See, because it's as because Joshua put it to a choice here, that means that the children of Israel were not victims to the generational curses, the generational sins, nor the present sins. Hallelujah. You have to believe that you have a choice. Hallelujah. You are not a victim of your circumstances. And because you have a choice, you can be a victor over your circumstances. Somebody shout, I have a choice. Revelations 12 and 11 says they overcame him by the what? Come on. And by the what? And they love not their lives unto death. Let me say this to you. You have a choice today. If you're going through something, if you're dealing with something, trying to bind you, whether it be from your past, from your family, your bloodline, or from your present circumstances and situations, you have a choice to put your faith in the blood that's been shed for your redemption. You have a choice to open your mouth and declare that the blood has redeemed me and the devil can't cross this bloodline. Come on. Somebody shout, I have a choice. And you have a choice to fall so in love with Jesus more than you are with your own life and this world. And the Bible says that if you'll choose these things, according to Romans 12 and 11, if you'll choose the blood, if you'll choose to open your mouth and declare what the blood has done for you, and if you'll choose to love Jesus more than anything, then you've got a choice to overcome and not be overcame. Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say this, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor. Hallelujah. I'm a victor, come on, I say it, I'm a victor because Jesus and what he did at the cross, hallelujah, has given me a choice. Amen. Well, oh, it can't be that simple. No, it's that simple. It's that simple. Hallelujah. But now look at the position of the leadership. Hallelujah. Look at the position of the leadership. Hallelujah. <laughs> Joshua said, you do what you want. You go ahead and choose whatever you want to choose. But the leadership says, as for me and my house, amen, we will serve the Lord. We will choose the Lord. Amen. Let me help you understand this dynamic between me and you. If you don't already understand, let me help you understand it. Are you ready? Leadership is not here. I'm, I'm not here to make you do anything. Uh, amen. I'm not here to make you do anything. Leadership is not there to give you some magical answer or some quick fix prayer that's going to fix everything in your life. Leadership is here to lead you 
Hallelujah. To make the choice that's going to set you free. We're here to lead you into deliverance and you've got to make the choice to follow our leadership. And so what does leadership do? It does what Joshua did. Leadership shows you what choice to make. Then you have to choose to follow the example of your leadership and make the same choices in your life. Joshua said, you do what you want to do, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to choose God. Hallelujah. And so Joshua wasn't there to make them or force them to choose his God. He was there to show them the choice to make. And he was there to let them know, watch my life. If you make the choices I make, you'll have what I have. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. I'm here to be an example in front of you. And I'm here to make choices in my life. That if you will look at that and see the choices that Lisa and I make and our family makes, hallelujah, you can have the results that her and I have in our life. Amen. So I choose to be faithful. Now, I don't make you be faithful, but I choose to be faithful. And I hope that you see that my faith, my choice to be faithful is bringing blessings in my life. And then therefore you will choose to be faithful. Huh? I choose to walk in faith. I choose to watch my words. I choose to worship. I choose to get up here no matter how I feel. Hallelujah. Amen. I went to bed at four o'clock in the morning last night, drove all the way from uh, West Palm Beach and got up and came to church at nine o'clock, rehearsed music, got things together, worshiped, played the drums, sung, preached, because I want you to know that that's the choice I make. And so I want you to see the choices I make and you say, I think I'll make those choices because I'm seeing that God's moving in his life. Now, I can't make you come home at four o'clock in the morning and get up and come to church. But I hope you see that that I that I'm making choices. Are you hearing what I'm saying? To be faithful to God. And I hope you see that and you'll make those same choices in your life. Huh? Amen. I make choices on what my kids do, listen to, wear, look like. I hope you see those choices. I'm not here to make you make your kids do the same things that my kids do, but I'm here, but I'm making choices in front of you in hopes that you'll see those choices and say, I might need to make those some of those choices too, because they're kids, pretty good kids. You see what the Lord's doing in my kids' life? And you know why my kids are doing that? You know why my kids are singing, worshiping, prophesying? You know why that, that some, like, my two girls are, uh, got asked to go on a uh, vacation with somebody because they're good kids? And why are they like that? Why are they kids that people like and want to be around? Why are they kids that are in here filled with the Holy Ghost? Why is my 17-year-old son prophesying and laying hands on people and they're falling out on the floor? Why, why is that happening? It's because of choices we made. The choices when they was little. Coming on up. Amen. And those choices made us victors over this world. My kids were never a victim of the sin. I never have. I, I don't ever. I'm never going to have to pray them out of addiction. I'm never going to pr have to pray them out of homosexuality. I'm never going to have to pray them out of a crack house. I'm never going to have to pray them uh, out of partying and, and the bar life. Why? Because I made choices. And those choices kept me from being a I never was a victim of this world. I sent my kids to public school, but they never thought that we came from monkeys. Why? Because I made a choice to teach them. That stuff is a lie of the devil. We were created by God. Hallelujah. And the power of his word. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. See, you're not a victim. Are you getting this? Is anybody getting this? You're not a victim. Don't ever think you're a victim because you have choices. Choose. Choose to serve the Lord. Well, what am I going to do in this situation? I'm going to choose to do whatever serves the Lord. What am I going to do about my kids here? Well, figure out whatever glorifies God and choose that. What am I going to what 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 am I going to do about this situation in my home? Figure out what choice will glorify God and do that. Well, if it what if it's the hard choice? <laughs> Choose it. Cuz you come from a long line of people that made choices that put them in lions dens and furnaces. Come on, in prison, but God delivered them out of of all of those. Come on somebody. Woo! Thank you Jesus. Come on, if you make this choice, I'm going to turn this heat up and throw you in this fire. Go ahead. Hallelujah. My choice is still the same. I'm going to glorify God. I'm not bowing to your image. Come on. Come on, young people. Hallelujah. You've got choices. You're not a victim of what's going on in the school system. You don't have to give in to the, to the mentality and the darkness and the sin of your school system. You've got a choice to glorify God. That's what Josh was saying. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Woo, how I feel the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, amen. Choose who you're going to serve today. When you go to school, choose who you're going to serve. When they say, come over here, look at this video I found. Ha, 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 ha. You got to make a choice. Uh, I'm not looking at that. Choose whom you're going to serve. Because if you choose God and choose not to look at that video, guess what? You don't become a victim of lust or whatever's going on in that video. Right? Come here, listen to this joke I heard. And you know it's going to be a bad joke because that kid always tells dirty jokes. Right? So you choose who you're going to serve. And you say, my ears is not a trash can. And you walk away. Come on. Amen. Or you start telling them about Jesus and make them walk away. However, however you want to do it, I don't, it don't matter. But you got to make a choice. And then when I make that choice, watch this. Are you, under, are you learning this? When I make that choice to glorify God and not listen to that joke, then I don't get pulled in and that seed of Satan doesn't get sowed into my heart. Come on. Tosh, find, um, can I, I just obey the Holy Spirit? Find James um, chapter 1. Where it talks about, I think, it, just put the whole chapter up there. I don't know what verse it is. Where it talks about sin is a, uh, when it's conceived. James chapter 1. Yes. Let me show you this, young people. Listen to me. Are y'all good? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you got it? Verse fi Is it verse 15? Really? Okay. Yes. Ver go back to verse 14. Um, look at this, young people. Listen to me. Somebody say this. I have a choice. I'm not a victim because I have a choice. Look at this. But every man is tempted... When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, right? Then when lust has conceived, when lust has conceived, everybody say when lust has conceived. Lust has conceived. What does it conceive? When lust has conceived, it brings forth what? Sin. All right. And sin, when it's finished or when it's done, when sin gets done with you, if you allow sin to stay in your life and it gets done with you, look what it says. When sin, uh, when it's finished, it brings forth what? Death of your joy. Death of your peace. Death of your mind. Right? So look. Look at this process. When lust has conceived, you know what it means to conceive, like when a woman conceives a baby. The only way you can conceive 
is there's got to be a seed sown. You can't conceive without a seed. Lust cannot, you've got, every one of you's got a lust on the inside of you. Amen. Lust is not bad. It's bad when it's perverted. It's good to lust after God. You should lust after the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You should lust after the presence of God. It's just when lust is perverted. How does lust get perverted? With a perverted seed. When that sin seed gets sowed in, what? That video, that song. I can't believe that some of these, some of these songs that are coming out of people's trucks and cars when I'm going down the highway. Setting at the, you ever heard them? Huh? You know, used to the songs talked about, you know, we're going to, uh, I'm going to love you, you know, and it talked about holding hands. And it might have talked about giving a kiss. Now we're straight up getting naked on the first verse. Huh? Am I, am I right? These songs, these kids are listening to. Well, I'm listening to it just for the beat. Okay, well then go and get the soundtrack without the lyrics and tell me you're listening to it for the beat. You ain't listening to it for the beat. You're listening to it for the song, the words. And you're hearing those words. What do you think that is? It's a seed. It's talking about sex and it's talking about doing things to the, to the uh, other person that shouldn't be talked about, shouldn't be listened to. Why, why do you think these young kids are getting pregnant at such early ages? Come on. It's the seed. The seed. You, you've got lust and if you sow sinful things in to that Lust, what's it going to do? It's going to conceive what? Sin. And if that sin remains, guess what's going to be the end? Death. Are you hearing me? So, how do I stay free from sin? I have a choice. Am I right, Austin? I have a choice not to watch that, not to listen to that, not to hear that. Right? Now, when my kids were young, they didn't know how to make the choice, so I made it for them. We're not listening to that. Every now and then, my kids will start singing some song. And it'll be like talking about drinking. I said, Emma, what are they drinking? She goes, oh, they're drinking tea, Dad. They're drinking sweet tea. <laughs> I, said, I said, Emma, they ain't drinking sweet tea. <laughs> Come on. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are, where are they going? They start singing, talking, they're going, so I'm like, where are they going? Oh, uh, they're, they're going to, um, uh, uh, you know, and they're, they're stumbling around, saying, so no, we're not singing that. We're not listening to that. Come on. We're making a choice right now not to allow that sin seed to get into your lust and get your lust stirred up. And then all of a sudden now you're thinking about, come on, man, these young, these young, these, young, that's why I won't hardly let my daughters date. I was a little more lenient with Seth. You know, he got over there with that girl over there. Look, but she, 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 he got a good thing. He's over there taking notes. <laughs> well, my girls, man, uh, they, these, these young boys, can I be real with you? These young boys, these young 14 and 15 year old boys addicted to uh, pornography on their phone, listening to songs in their car about sex, and then they're doing all of this on their way to meet my daughter. 
No, because you know what's already, you know what's been stirred up in them? You know what's been stirred up in their lust? You, you can guess what's been stirred up in their lust. And they've got their hormones going. And then I'm going to let them go be alone with my daughter? The devil is a liar. No chance. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. I, what here? Let me tell you. Now, y'all don't have to make this choice, but this is what I'm. This is what I'm. I t I'm trying to teach my kids, and what I'm teaching my girls. Every time we talk about dating and stuff, I said, "Girls," and I even tried to teach this to Seth. Is, and and, you know, with him, him and Bailey, that's together. He 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 honored me on this, and I'm trying to teach it to my girls because I did it. Growing up. I said, girls, you don't have to date to find out who you need to marry. You ain't got to date and have a bunch of relationships and, and do like the world does and, and live with somebody, sleep around and do all this stuff and end up with a, that's a whole other message I could go into, but end up with a lot of heartache, heartbreak and problems. So you don't have to do that, girls. You can pray and by faith, God can show you exactly who you're supposed to be with. And you don't have to go through all of those relationship things and heartaches and heartbreaks and risk, yeah. risk a lot of things, opening up the door to a lot of things, diseases and devils and demons and problems that you have to deal with years down the road. And so I'm trying to teach my girls, pray and ask God. Show, let him show you. Because God did that for me. He showed me Lisa. I prayed and I knew that I was supposed to be with Lisa. She didn't know. It took her a while. She figured it out, though. And, 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 and we're still, we, we've been together. And so... And, and and so we've been together since we pretty much grew up together. We've been together since we were teenagers. And so, but the Lord showed me. And and I'm telling you, young folk, you can do the same thing. Right. Amen. Yeah. You've got a choice. Yeah. What does that mean? I don't have to be a victim of STDs. Yeah. I don't have to be a victim of being young and pregnant and not having my life together. I don't have to be a victim of having heartaches and heartbreaks from all of these relationships. And let me tell you something. Do you know that when the, the Bible says that when two people, can, can I be, is this all right? If you've got kids, you don't want to hear this, just cover their ears. I don't know what to tell you, hallelujah, but we're just talking about real stuff. Do you know when two people come together and, and have intimacy, physical intimacy, that their spirits become one? And through that, you can create a bridge, an open door into your spirit for whatever's going on in their spirit? Young folk. You hear me? Right? And then you come out of that relationship with that person. And guess what? Just because you got out of the relationship doesn't mean you're free from them. There's still ties there. And you still carry things from that relationship that attacked you and afflict you in your life. But you've got a choice. You don't have to be a victim of those type of things because you've got a choice to serve the Lord and say, God, show me who I need to be with. Come on, somebody. This was not in my notes. How did, none of it. None of it. None of, absolutely none of it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Somebody say, I've got a choice. You don't have to suffer because you have a choice. Hallelujah. Now, what in the world do else do I want to say here? Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, the leaders. I did what? Yeah, that was a long time ago. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we went around the barn. Let's, I guess we can get back on the main road now. Hallelujah. Amen. But you, you, you need to have leadership that's making right choices in front of you. Come on, somebody. 
That's why the Bible says that if you want the office of a bishop, then you should rule your house well. Meaning if you're going to be leading in front of somebody, you need to be somebody that's making right choices in their life, in your own life. Amen. You need a Joshua in your life that you can see over and over. They are making choices that's bringing peace and victory in their homes. That's what you need in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't want you to follow me just because I, I'm exciting and I'm a good preacher and we have moves of the Holy. I want you to follow me because you see that I'm making good choices. Because I've been around a lot of gifted, anointed speakers that wasn't making good choices in their life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then Joshua says in Joshua chapter 24, look back, look down, go back to that, Taj, verse 20, 24, go down to 24. The people said to Joshua, watch this, the Lord your God will we serve. This is what the people responded to him, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shashim. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord or the tabernacle. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us, and it shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. Basically, Joshua was going to take a big stone and he was going to set it under this tree by the sanctuary or the tabernacle, so that when everybody went to the tabernacle, amen, they would see the stone and be reminded of their choice. Not only do you got a choice and do you need to make a choice that glorifies God, but you need to be reminded of the choice you made. Somebody say amen. <laughs> some of you forget the choices that you made. Come on. You, some of you forget by Monday the choice you made on Sunday that I'm going to praise God anyway. You forgot on Monday, right? And so Joshua said, we're going to set this stone here, and it's going to be a reminder. So watch this. Every time the people went to church, they were reminded of the choice they made. That I'm going to serve God and not the gods of my fathers or the gods of the Amorites. Remember that message I preached a long time ago, why should I go to church? Can I add another thing to it? You should go to church because it reminds you of your choice. Amen. It reminds you. Lisa said this morning, you need, she said, I needed all those songs. I needed all of that that was sung. I needed all that that was said. Why did she need it? Because it reminded her of the choice that she's made in her life to serve God. The choice to glorify God. The choice to be faithful to him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. How many comes into the house of God and gets reminded of the choice you made? Because you getting out there and getting pulled this way and pulled that way, but you come to the house of God and you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, God, I, I chose to serve you a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Hallelujah. Thank you. I didn't. I, come on. Amen. Hallelujah. I've chosen your word. I've chosen your promises. I've chosen you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me talk to, the, to you about this, about what Paul says. Look at this. Somebody say, I have a choice. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to be a victim. Say it. I don't have to be a victim. I can have victory because I have a choice. Amen. Let's say you make the wrong choice. I was talking about it earlier. You make the wrong choice. Let's say you just you make the wrong choice. Well, you still have a choice. You have a choice to repent. You have a choice to look and go to that advocate that you have with the Father, Jesus. Come on. 
And you have a choice to let him take everything and work it out for your good. Here's the, here's the victory. You're never without a choice. Even when you make the wrong choice, you still have a choice. Well, isn't it good? Hallelujah. Look how free you are. Come on, somebody. I said, look how free you are. Jonah made a choice to go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh. Come on, amen. And here's the thing, here's the thing about making the wrong choice. You know, Jonah chose, chose not to go to Nineveh when God told him to go to Nineveh and, and speak to the people and tell them to repent. Nineveh was a wicked place. He didn't want to go down there. It's like going to Chicago where they're shooting people every day. And God's saying, go to Chicago, go to the streets where the, where the gangbangers are and tell them to repent. And it's like, <laughs> send Taj, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Because I didn't send Taj, I sent you, right? That's the same thing. And, and, and Jonah said, I don't want to go. And Jonah went down to uh, Hopa go, to try to go the other way. Guess what was down there at Hopa at the harbor? There was a boat. Guess where it was going? The other way. There will, whenever you decide I'm going to make a, the opposite choice of what God wants me to do, guess what? There will always be a boat going the other way. Come on, somebody. When you decide I'm not going to choose God and I'm not going to choose his will and I'm not going to choose to serve him, guess what? There are God, the, just like God will always make a way for you to do his will, the devil will always make a way for you to not do God's will. Huh? But here's the, here's the, here's the redemption of Jonah. That when Jonah got thrown off of that boat because he understood God sent a storm because Jonah was going to do what, what God told him to do. And he told him, throw me off of this boat. He said, because I'm the reason this storm's coming. And God created a fish that swallowed him. That wasn't judgment. That was mercy. And in three days, he spent in that fish. Boy, some folks are stubborn. It wouldn't have took me three. Would it took you three days in a fish to <laughs> repent? Man, that's stubborn, ain't it? Good Lord, three days in a fish. Uh-uh. I'd have probably repented at the storm, but man, he still, he was, he, man, I'm telling you, he was full of pride. Three days in that fish, but he finally repented. The Bible says out of hell he cried and God heard his voice. And the, watch this. Here's the redemption. Here's the awesome thing. You still have a choice. Why? Because the Bible says God spoke to Jonah a second time. Are you hearing me? Jonah wasn't in my notes either. Hallelujah. John, God spoke to Jonah a second time. How many has, has experienced God speaking a second time? How about a third time? How about a fourth time? <laughs> Can I get five? Six. Anybody got six? Can I get eight? <laughs> Amen. That's the mercy of God, right? That Jonah made the wrong choice, but he still had a choice. And that fish vomited him up on the, on the shore. And he went to Nineveh smelling like fish vomit. That's good, though. Hey, Amen. I got some fish vomit on me. You know what that means? That means that Jonah went to Nineveh reminded of his rebellion and where his rebellion got him. I've got some fish vomit on me. Why? Because I've made some wrong choices, but I can still smell that wrong choice. And it reminds me, you better make the right choice this time. Yeah. Right? Amen? Even when you make the wrong choice, you still got a choice. Because you're free. You're not a victim. You're not, even, you're not a victim of your own bad choices. That's amazing to me. I'm so free that I'm never even a victim of my bad choices. 
because I've always got another choice to make because I've got this loving God full of mercy and long suffering and he never gets mad at me and he never gives up on me and he never leaves me and he never walks away from me and he never says I'm done with you and his gifts and callings are without repentance which means he never changes his mind about what he called me to do no matter how goofy I get and how rebellious I get hallelujah years later he'll look at me and say I still got a calling for you still got something for you to do and guess what I'll give you the years the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten and I'll turn it all around and I'll put you back where you need to be because you still got a choice <laughs> you're never without a choice amen amen let me give you this and I will pray 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Paul said this very familiar passage of scripture and we'll, we'll, we'll end with this I, I, I believe 1 Corinthians chapter 15 how many has heard this verse 31 Paul says I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord I what I die daily now the Living Bible Translation says, 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Look at the Living Bible Translation. It says, for it is a fact that I face death daily. That is as true as my pride in, in your growth in the Lord. And Paul says, just as true as it is that I am so proud of your growth in the Lord, he says, I face death on a daily basis. Now listen to me. I'm going to teach this to you real quick and we're going to pray. I feel like we need to pray. We need to come up here in this altar and pray and gather around and just let the Holy Ghost lead us. And, and we might need to pray for one another. Amen. In context, in this chapter, Paul is disputing the fact that there is no resurrection of the dead. If you study this chapter. People are teaching that the dead, that there's no resurrection of the dead, that it's not going to happen, that those that are, that, that are dead, is, they're just dead. And so he's saying here, watch this, this is what he's saying in context. When he says, I die daily or I face death daily, he says, why would I put myself in jeopardy to preach the gospel if there's no resurrection from the dead? He even says that in this chapter, Right? If there's no resurrection from the dead, why would I put myself in jeopardy and preach this gospel and, and risk dying and being killed? How many knows Paul was, was, went through some stuff that should have killed him and, and he might have he died and God raised him back from the dead. The, the Bible says he was stoned and left for dead. The Bible also says he saw the third heaven, so I don't know if that's when he saw the third heaven. He might have died and God raised him from the dead. But look, he said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, why am I putting myself in this jeopardy? Why am I facing death daily? He said, but he's letting them know that because there's a resurrection from the dead, that means that death is defeated. Come on, how many believes death is defeated? Who defeated it? Jesus, come on, on the third day, didn't he get up and defeat death, hell, and the grave? So Paul is saying, therefore, and he's saying in this chapter, he's saying, I'm going to face death on a regular basis because I know that there's a resurrection. I know death is defeated. I know death is not my end. As a matter of fact, the believer, hallelujah, needs to understand that death is not the end. It's the beginning. Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. But notice how the King James translate this scripture to say, put the King James version back up there. He says, Lord, I die daily. I like that translation. Now, this morning I showed you a King James translation that I didn't like, but I'm showing you one here that I like. He said, I die daily. Now, in what sense did Paul die not in the sense of not living anymore, but he died in the sense of disconnection from this world. Death isn't just the halting of life. Death is actually a word that means separation 
For instance, if, if I have a dead wire, what does that mean? That means it's been disconnected from its source of power. There's nothing flowing through it. Somebody say amen. amen. To die to this world means to disconnect from this world. It means that this world no longer moves me. This world and its enticement and its lusts and its things, its, its, its sin, its darkness, none of that stuff, none of it moves me. None of it draws me anymore. None of it entices me. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. If, if there's a dead body laying in front of me, I can poke it, smack it, and do everything to it. I can hook it up to a, a battery and, and shock it. Hallelujah. But it's not going to respond because it's dead. And Paul died in the sense that he, that, that the world didn't get a response out of him anymore. Whoo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, but for Paul, watch this please. Are you still with me? Because we're almost done. We're going to pray. For Paul to die daily. Everybody say daily. For Paul to die daily meant this. That every day he had to disconnect himself from the world and the things around him. Are you listening to me? For Paul to die daily meant, whoo, hallelujah, that every day he had to make the choice. Are you hear me? Every day he had to make the choice between Jesus and the world. Come on, somebody. We're getting right down to it. What I'm getting ready to talk to you about, I love, I love the moving of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have it here in a moment. I love the laying on of hands, those times in the Spirit where you get slapped and by the Holy Ghost and you fall out on the floor and, and you run all over. I love all that stuff. But I'm getting down to the real deal here. The, here's the real deal. Here's the real deal. Those times are wonderful. Those times are recharging. Those times are those moments of breakthrough. But you are not going to live in victory off of those moments. Let me tell you how you're going to live in victory. You're going to die daily. What do you mean? On a daily basis, you're going to have to make the choice to disconnect from the world and I'm going to make it to you as simple as possible. You're going to have to make the choice to choose Jesus over everything. That's dying daily. Every day, making the choice. This is what Paul says. I die daily. I make the choice every day. Watch this, please. I make the choice every day to choose Jesus over everything in the world. Jesus over money. Jesus over Reputation. Jesus over friends. Jesus over family. Jesus over my wife. Jesus over my children. Jesus over everything. That's dying daily. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So if, now watch this, please. If Paul died daily, that meant that that Watch this. Please help, help me, Lord. Help me say this. If Paul died daily, that means every day he woke up, there was a part of him that was alive to the world that he had to kill. There is not a one-time prayer. There's not a one-time move of the Holy Ghost. There's not a one-time slap on the head and fall on the floor that's going to make you completely disconnect from the world. Every day that you wake up, there's a part of you that's going to be alive to the world. You're a three-part being, spirit, soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, and, and body. You've, you're a spirit that has a soul, a mind, will, and emotions, the ability to think, feel, and choose, and you function in a body. The only part of you that's completely dead until the Lord comes back is your spirit. Your spirit has died to the world, and it's alive to God. Thank God. But your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, and your body still alive to the world. And guess what? That's where you got to die daily. 
You are not, I'm, I'm, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. You are not going to wake up every morning speaking in tongues and seeing angels. Huh? None of you are waking up in the morning and the angels are carrying you out of the bed and dressing you in the morning while you're hearing holy, holy is the lamb. And seeing the throne of God and the glory cloud is filling the house while you're walking. And when you, and when you sneeze, everybody falls out on the floor in the house and has visions of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's not happening. You all are waking up and you're like, Ugh, I don't want to talk to nobody. Ugh, is it Sunday? Ugh, I got to go to church. Ugh. So what do you got to do? You got to die. That soul, that soulless part of you that feels the stress and feels the, the oppression, that soulless part of you every day when you step out in the world, your soul is still alive to the things of this world, it's still alive to certain desires, it's still alive to certain things. And so what do you got to do? You got to do what Paul did. You got to die daily. You got to make a choice in the morning. Sometimes three or four times in the morning, you got to make a choice to die. What does that mean? What does that simply mean? That means whatever's encountering me today, the, 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 the things of this world that's encountering me, that's enticing me to do something ungodly, I have to make a choice in that moment. No, I'm going to choose God. Right? Hallelujah. I go to work or go to school. There's all time. I got to die all the time. Right? And every time I choose Jesus, what am I doing? I'm dying to this world. And guess what? I go home and go to bed and it's like, whew, thank you, Lord, for making me make it through the day. Guess what? In about six hours or eight hours or whatever, how many hours you sleep? Three hours or whatever. You're going to wake up and guess what? You got to do it all over again. And you know what? I, I hate to put a damper on this, but you're going to have to do it all over again until the Lord comes back. I'm sorry. If you live for the next 50 years and, and the rapture don't take for place for 50 years or you live for another 100 years, guess what? For 100 years, 365 days out of that year, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to wake up and die. And how do I die? I make a choice. But here's the freedom. The freedom is I can die. That's the freedom that I don't have to stay bound to sin. I don't have to stay bound to wickedness. I don't have to stay bound to darkness. I have a choice. I can die. That's the wonderful thing about Paul. Paul, Austin, history says, I got to hush. History says, I feel like Wednesday night, I just couldn't shut up, hallelujah, but I, I'm going to hush, I promise, I promise I'm going to hush. But that's why the history says Paul ran to the chopping block. When he, when he told Timothy, he says, I ran my course, I'm ready to be offered up. He knew he was going to be a martyr. And when they were getting ready to cut his head off, and he knew, I'm not getting out of this. God's not going to shake the jail, and, and, and he's not going to deliver me and, because I'm done. I've finished my work. When he... <laughs> Todd. <laughs> oh, man. When he saw death. Because to Paul... He had already died to the world. There wasn't nothing that they could, they, they could threaten him with death, but it didn't move him. Because he had already died to everything they was going to separate him from. The reason he ran to the chopping block is because Paul knew to be absent from the body. To be present with the Lord. The one I've been choosing this whole time. <laughs> So when he, when he knew God was going to let him die, he said, oh, that's my door to get to Jesus. Oh, I've been wanting to be. Remember, he said, I'm caught between 
to, to, I'm caught between, uh, you know, uh, I'm caught in a hard place. He said, I want to stay here for you because I know you need me to teach you. Hallelujah. But I also want to go be with him. <laughs> Whew. And then they said, we're going to kill you, Paul. Paul said, that don't bother me because I've already died to everything. I've chose Jesus over everything. I've done this on a daily basis. There ain't nothing you can separate me from that I ain't already separated myself from. And if you're going to kill me, go ahead, because death means I'm going to be with him. <laughs> so the only thing you're going to do by killing me is put me with the one that I've chose every day of my life over and over and over again because I'm so <laughs> love with him. And if you kill me, I just get to be with him. <laughs> I'm worried that the modern church is so in love with this world that we don't want to die. Come on, amen. We're so in love with this world, we don't we, we don't want the we don't want to talk about the Lord coming back. We don't want to think about the Lord coming back. Huh? Oh, Revelations is a scary book. For who? For who? Who do you know who you are in that book? You ain't the one having the the, the scorpions that look like horses and snakes and this the Steven Spielberg thing that I don't know that Hollywood could even come up with what Revelation is coming up with. You're not the one getting bitten and eaten by that stuff. You're the ones that's sitting around the throne. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, come on with the 24 elders going crying holy is the lamb come on somebody <laughs> revelation is a scary book for who not for you and if you really read revelations it's a book about revival it's a book about redemption it's a book about whew, oh my gosh it's a book about the glory of the Lord. It's a book about a God who loves us so much and hates sin and wickedness. Oh, God. Oh, I got to hush. Thank you, Lord. Does this make sense to anybody? The, the, the reason that this world is such a bondage to you right now is because you've not died to it. And the reason you've not died to it is because you haven't made a choice. Because the devil's told you you don't have a choice. That you gotta suffer this. That you gotta feel this. No. You have a choice. Choose the blood. Choose the word. Choose the presence of the Lord. Choose to praise God. Oh, God, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, lift your hands in this place. Just thank you. David said, and you can cut that camera off here in a minute, um, Tyson. Just keep it rolling just for a second. But David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. David didn't say, I, I'm going to praise him because I feel like it. He's making a choice. He said, I will, it, which means praise was a matter of his will. It was a matter of his choice. You've got a choice today not to feel the depression, not to feel the darkness or the heaviness. You've got a choice to lift your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. 